Welcome to our Sunday supper. We're just back from an essential road trip to the Bay Area to retrieve our son Grant's stuff from his apartment because his lease ended at Stanford. We rented an SUV, loaded it up, and drove home. There was a surprising amount of traffic on the roads, and big parts of Oregon are starting to open up as of this weekend. There is hope. On today's show, we have two guests, State Senator Hans Zeiger, who is now a candidate for Pierce County Council, will be talking about his proposal to limit the governor's executive and emergency powers. And Maya Espinoza joins us as well. She's the founder and former executive director of the Center for Latino Leadership. Maya is now a candidate for the superintendent of public instruction, and she'll talk about her ideas to help families teach their kids while they're home during the pandemic and what she thinks is wrong with the recent K through 12 sex ed bill that was passed by the legislature this session. Hans, Maya, and my husband, Mike, all filed to run for their offices this week. So they'll also talk about what it's like to be a candidate and run for office during a pandemic. Now, here's Mike. Thank you, Camille, and hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you today and welcome to our Sunday supper. Um, we'll call this the How to Reign in Government Overreach episode, because this week we'll explore how much power Governor Inslee should have and for how long under our state's emergency power laws. And we'll talk about whether decisions about teaching sex ed to our children should best be made by the legislature or by a local school board. This week, the Wisconsin Supreme Court struck down that state's stay-at-home order saying enough time had passed for the order to be reviewed by the legislature. There are now dozens of lawsuits around the country challenging the constitutional power of state gov governors to impose strict stay-at-home limits to fight COVID-19. Last week, we heard from my former law partner, Joel Ard, who has brought two lawsuits challenging Governor Inslee's stay-at-home order as violating citizens' constitutional rights. And in a moment, we'll talk with State Senator Hans Zeiger, who has proposed changes to our state emergency laws to limit the governor's power. But first, let me talk about the role of the Attorney General on these issues, since that's the office I'm running for. In our state, the Attorney General has a dual role. First, he or she is a legal advisor to state officials. The Attorney General regularly issues formal opinions to guide public officials on how they can do their jobs consistent with our Constitution. Second, the Attorney General has a duty to protect the citizens of our state. Bob Ferguson has sued President Trump more than 55 times in partisan lawsuits, for example, and he has threatened to sue other officials who he believes are not following the law. But our current Attorney General has said nothing publicly about the legality of the emergency orders. He's offered no guidance through attorney general opinions. In fact, he's offered no public opinion at all on whether they are constitutional. Our state, like many others, decided to have an independent attorney general elected directly by the people and not appointed by the governor. The attorney general should be a check and balance on the governor or other state officials if they overreach their powers. Bob Ferguson is failing in his most important role as attorney general. What's at stake is the rule of law itself. Should one elected official have the power for an unlimited amount of time to dictate the rules for an entire state and to have the sole authority to decide when those emergency powers should end? The Wisconsin Supreme Court said it well last week. If a forest fire breaks out, it said, there is no time for debate, action is needed. But in the case of a pandemic, which lasts month after month, the governor cannot rely on emergency powers indefinitely. I filed to run for attorney general this week because I believe the rule of law is what makes this country so special and it's worth fighting for. So this election for me is about protecting the evergreen state by providing a check and balance against political overreach. Now let's hear from Hans Zeiger. Hans, are you with us? I'm here, thank you, Mike, very much. Good to be with you again and uh, thanks for filing. Uh, I think you're doing a, a noble thing this year. 
Well, thank you, Hans. And you filed this week as well. Is that right? I, I did. I'm running for the Pierce County Council, which is a change for me. I've been in the legislature the last 10 years, but uh, looking forward to moving into local government and a lot of reasons to do that right now. Well, I have to say when we did our little warm up, um, I enjoyed seeing your, is it, is it a daughter or a son yeah. that you, you had yep. on your, on your shoulder? Yeah, Aubrey yeah. is uh, six weeks old and what a blessing in the midst of uh, all that we're, we're seeing right now in our world. Yes. Well, we'll have her on, on the next show and we'll get her opinions as from, from a young voter's perspective. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, Hans, uh, thank you for joining us as a state Senator you sponsored legislation to limit some of the governor's emergency powers to just 30 days unless extended. Can you explain how that part of the law works? Yeah, so let, let me give a bit of context here because uh, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about our state's emergency powers law and uh, different rumors flying around about what the legislature can and can't do under that law. And um, most of that statute uh, goes back to 1969 uh, and, and think, you know, the Vietnam era, a lot of civil unrest during that time period. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, the, the principle of emergency powers that is recognized pretty consistently across the country. In fact, every governor has emergency powers in, um, in their laws uh, goes back to English common law. So there's a long tradition of in times of emergency, executives ought to have um, a greater ability to act and ought to be able to do that uh, with expedience. Um, so we recognize that in the executive separate from the legislature. But our society as a, a free society was not meant to operate you know, on an ongoing basis with emergency powers. So we do recognize some limits to that. And um, one of the things that there was some interest in doing over the last few years was to give additional flexibility within our emergency power statute when it comes to waiving uh, laws and regulations during times of emergency. Uh, the National Guard and a number of emergency management agencies throughout our state uh, did a, an exercise to prepare for a big earthquake back in 2016 uh, called uh, Cascadia Rising, prepare for a big Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And so that was on my mind as I got involved in this issue in the legislature, thinking about how do we get prepared for earthquake, volcanic eruption, fires, floods, those kinds of events. Um, and um, as we embarked on legislation to give that additional flexibility, there were a few other things that we did in, in uh, a bill that ultimately passed in 2019. One was we took out a provision from that 1969 uh, law that allowed for the governor to seize firearms during an emergency. And it was important, I think, to uphold our Second Amendment rights that we removed that. And so uh, that, that was successfully included in the bill that passed last year. There was also a protection for First Amendment rights. And there was bipartisan recognition, but particularly led by uh, Senator Bob Hasegawa from Seattle, that we ought to have protections for free assembly and free speech written into uh, our emergency powers statute. And then the, the, the other thing that was very important to me to include in the bill that passed last year was to have some additional legislative input, um, uh, legislative oversight when it comes to the governor's exercise of emergency powers. And so we included a provision when the governor waives those statutes or regulations, the legislature needs to give its approval or disapproval if the, if the governor seeks to extend uh, those waivers beyond 30 days. So that applies to those waivers of statutes and regulations. What it does not apply to is a separate uh, area of police powers that the governor had uh, predating that law that we passed last year, uh, where the governor can prohibit actions. And uh, the stay home, stay healthy order falls into that category. The legislature had no say in the crafting or in the implementation of the stay home, stay healthy order. And I believe in light of just the, the magnitude of how that is impacting people's lives in terms of the uh, what we're learning uh, day in and day out by the experience that we're all going through right now. To me, it is clear that the legislature needs to have um, the ability to approve or disapprove any emergency power, exercise of emergency powers that the governor uses if he seeks to extend that beyond 30 days. And that's not just about this situation. I think that that would ring true whether whether a Republican governor or a Democratic governor. Um, we need to have checks and balances in place uh, in times, even in times of emergencies. 
and uh, we, we can give the governor the ability for 30 days to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do what's necessary without the legislature um, exercising that check. But once that 30 day mark hits, uh, then it's time for the legislature to weigh in. And I believe that uh, we should have had more powers, you know, look, looking at this situation, I think it would have been appropriate if we had had more powers to act in our current situation. Your, your, um, your mention of um, English common law reminds me uh, of what I learned in law school, which is much of English common law was derived from Roman law because England was part of the Roman Empire. I'm really giving you a history lesson here, but the Romans had an interesting concept of giving essentially emergency power to um, one member of their government, um, which I'll get in trouble for using the word, but this is the word the Romans used. Uh, they called him a dictator because he had uh, unlimited power uh, to deal with the emergency at hand. Often it was military invasion, sometimes it was plague, but um, usually, if not always, the directive was was limited to six months or a very specified period of time, which is basically what you're you're advocating for. I'm I'm just curious, um, Hans, when you um, when the legislature amended this law, um, why didn't it put a limit on uh, the governor's broader emergency powers? Um, obviously, it thought thirty days was enough for certain powers, but not for the other powers. Was there a debate about that? You know, there was some early discussion about that, but, um, you know, and I, in retrospect, I wish we would have done that. Uh, I wish that we would have included the broader uh, legislative check on executive powers. I think um, in my mind, this, the, the bill was, um, you know, a foot in the door for the legislature to be able to have a say in uh, those emergency powers. Uh, and, and, and by the way, in practical experience, the way this has worked out is, uh, because the legislature is not in session right now, um, the uh, majority leaders of or the, the, the Speaker of the House and the minority leaders of the House and Senate and the majority leader of the Senate um, sign on to a letter when they choose to uh, take action on those 30-day extensions. And in most cases, uh, there's been four corners agreement on extending those, but there have been a, there have been some cases now where, uh, particularly the Republican caucuses, um, I think only the Republican caucuses have said we do not want to um, extend certain proclamations that the governor has made. By and large, the uh, waivers of laws and regulations have been, I would characterize as helpful to uh, mitigate the effects of the governor's stay home, stay healthy order. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think prudential kinds of considerations that uh, that allow it to be more bearable to certain people, uh, certain certain businesses, certain sectors of our society. Um, but the, the process I think is working effectively um, and there's been bipartisan collaboration and discussion in uh, most cases. And I would like to see that, as I said, extended to all, uh, all emergency actions by the governor, not just the waivers of rules and uh, laws. So um, you had an opinion piece um, printed in the Seattle Times this week, and you outlined this plan um, to limit the governor's emergency power. Was there anything else, and by the way, extremely well written and thoughtful as always, uh, shameless plug for Hans, uh, you know, one of the most thoughtful um, uh, politicians in our state period without any kind of limitation. Um, he's always always ahead of the curve and thinking about whether it's homelessness or issues like emergency powers or you name it. Um, I always learn things from wh whenever Hans speaks or when he uh, publishes something in the Seattle Times. Was, was there anything else uh, that you outlined in your piece, Hans, that you haven't talked about already here? Well, I think it's important to point out how other states are doing this because there are other states that um, have a broader role for the legislature. Um, uh, to play when it comes to the governor's emergency powers. And um, there are some states that have the 30-day uh, mark as the designation of when the legislature needs to weigh in about any of the governor's emergency powers. Um, there are a couple of states where in order to exercise, to declare an emergency at all, there has to be legislative approval. And um, I'm not sure I would go that far, although I think it's, it's worth discussion because I think we need to be thoughtful about, uh, about this now that we have the experience. Um, and so anyway, it's worth looking at how other states are doing this. Um, 
Now, we talked about this a little bit in the preparation here. Um, I agree with um, kind of in, in broad in a broad sense, what you've proposed for amending the emergency powers. I'm curious, since I'm running for attorney general, uh, if you see a role for the attorney general in either initially authorizing the exercise of emergency power or in uh, the reauthorization of emergency power. I know in some context, either at the national level or at state levels, attorneys general have that role. Um, it's not a formal role under statute today. What what do you think about the attorney general being in the loop on these things? Yeah, I think that that, that would make sense. I think uh, the more that we can have checks and balances, not only between the um, legislative branch and the executive, uh, the governor, uh, but also within the executive branch among the various elected officials in our state, I think that that's appropriate. And, um, you know, the, the governor has, uh, you know, a lot of authority in our law and the other statewide elected officials don't when it comes to those emergency powers. But I think we ought to think thoughtfully about, okay, uh, let, let's think about each of those statewide elected officials and and where they may have a role, um, you know, whether that's the superintendent of public construction, whether that's the insurance commissioner, whether that is uh, the attorney general and giving that extra legal advice and that uh, constitutional um, framework that I think is helpful to the governor is vital. So let, let's add that to the conversation, absolutely. We are certainly seeing what a huge impact the emergency order is having on our um, on our school children and their families. And um, of course, we're gonna to talk to Maya Espinosa in just a minute, um, Hans, and we're gonna come back to you at the end and talk about campaigning during a pandemic. Um, and of course, this issue of emergency powers, I don't think we're, this is gonna be the last of it. Um, it's you know top of mind. Um, as Camille mentioned, we drove back from uh, picking up our son's uh, gear in California, and much of Oregon is now opening uh, well ahead of Washington. Very interesting. Um, so this story continues to unfold. Um, now, uh, thank you, Hans. We're going to uh, talk with Maya Espinoza, who is running for the nonpartisan post of superintendent of public instruction. Uh, Maya, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Nice to see you again. Nice um, to see you, Mike. I read somewhere that uh, the K through 12 sex ed bill, which was passed by the legislature uh, this year, is what inspired you or maybe incensed you to run for uh, the office of SPI. Um, can you tell us what, what it was about the bill that got you so fired up? Oh, sure. So I've been involved in education in the past. I run an education-based nonprofit. I'm a teacher. I've got kids in school. Um, so I've paid attention to public education in this state uh, since moving here. But um, yeah, it was definitely this sex ed bill that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. This is what set me over the edge. And, um, you know, I it's become so notorious at this point that I really don't want to, you know, badger that story. But just to give a brief overview, um, this was a bill put forth by the superintendent, um, one of those agency request bills that Hans is very familiar with. Um, and this bill was a, a mandate of comprehensive uh, sex education. Um, statewide. So all districts had to provide uh, this type of curriculum. And this is unique because we don't do this with other subjects. Um, Reichdahl, uh, who's the current superintendent, said that it was the, you know, priority of his administration, his top concern this year. Um, and he, uh, in response to parents and teachers and school leaders that objected to the bill, or he presumed would be objecting, um, he said, you know, some people still teach that the earth is flat and that the Holocaust didn't happen, um, which I think was, you know, completely inappropriate, demeaning and bullying to an extent um, to, to talk about, you know, people with dissenting views in that way. Um, but moreover, it was the requirement of the specific curriculum options available now. So the bill itself, sure, mandates sex education statewide. Previously, that was decided upon by local school districts. 
and their communities. Um, but in this case, it required some type of this education. Uh, when parents and individuals started inquiring further as to, okay, what are those curriculum options? It became a lot scarier for a lot of people. Of course, once you start diving into a subject like this and you start peeling back the pages and looking at what your kids would actually be learning under this curriculum, parents started getting really involved. Um, and we saw them come out by, by the thousands to the Capitol to protest this bill. And this is another thing I think uh, Senator Zeiger would be able to testify to. Um, they, you know, these legislators said that they had never seen outcry like this, where you had 5,000 comments and inquiries to please oppose this bill to five, please support the bill. So when it passed party line, um, you know, just with no disregard or, or no regard for the hundreds of amendments that these legislators put up or the thousands of parents asking legislators to vote no, um, it was passed. And that was that night that it was passed at two o'clock in the morning, dead of night. We still had people in the galley, um, you know, during this time. That's how passionate people were about this issue. I just couldn't sit by any longer. I said, that's it. We cannot be ignored by such, you know, this is our, our highest budget line item is education in this state. And parents are the ones that are the recipient of those services. We've doubled education spending in this state in the last recent years. We've fully funded education, um, according to the governor. And I don't see that we're getting much difference. So I don't think that this bill should have been the priority for education in our state. We can talk about how our kids are measuring up, how, how student outcomes are right now. Um, but moreover, it's just the approach of this superintendent that he thinks he knows what's best for you, me, and our students. Um, and I don't think that that's the approach that that this office should take. I think it's nonpartisan for a reason, and we need to treat it that way. Let's, uh, since you invited Hans to comment, um, Hans, in your last session as a senator before you are elected to the Pierce County Council, which will happen this year, did you um, did you have any comments about the the way the bill rolled through the legislature this year? Yeah, thanks. You know the. Um, this was an issue that was very um, uh, polarizing between the, the uh, caucuses. Um, and, uh, you know, I think previously you saw uh, Frank Chop when he was speaker under his watch, this bill did not move out of the House. It moved out of the Senate in 2019, but did not move out of the House. And I think my, my read on that situation is that Chop knew that this was going to scare parents, um, and and one of the things I admire about Frank Chop and his his way of leading the house for 20 years is that he he was able to work in an incremental way. And and while we as Republicans uh, certainly don't agree with much of what he uh, the way he moved incrementally, um, th that was his style, and he didn't want to scare people. And I think this this is a bill that came along and really came across as very scary to parents. And we certainly heard feedback to that effect. Um, that was the, the top, um, uh, probably, pro probably we got more emails on that topic this session um, than any other topic. And the kinds of emails we got from parents as well as teachers and other concerned community members were uh, really freaking out about what they saw coming their way in terms of uh, uh, preemption of local control this broad statewide mandate. And, um, you know, our tradition of education in this state says that we're gonna, we're gonna do one thing really well at the state level when it comes to education and that's funding our system. Uh, but we're gonna come up with some broad standards and leave a lot of the policy role to the local districts. And this is the, the strongest state uh, mandate ever when it comes to what we're, what we're telling at a policy level our local school districts to do in their curriculum. And, um, my approach is we ought to be really cautious about doing that. And that's why you saw Republicans um, unanimous, all, all Republicans opposing 5395 in the legislature. Uh, we, we really saw it as legislative overreach saying Olympia knows best. Uh, we know better than parents and teachers at the local level. And this is one of those issues where you've just got to have 
a, a level of trust between those teachers and those parents when it comes to teaching this material. And if the state steps in and says, well, we know best, uh, you're going to find, I, I believe, a significant backlash. Um, and, and we're seeing that right now. And uh, Maya, back to you. Um, my understanding is there's a petition or a signature gathering process to put a referendum on the ballot to repeal this uh, K through 12 sex ed bill. Um, do you have a sense of how that's going? Are we gonna get a chance to vote on uh, that issue this fall on the general ballot? Well, many of us certainly hope so. Um, the numbers I think are, are going well, the progress is okay, um, but we have to you know, continue to push strong, of course, Given the social distancing constraints, it's extremely difficult to gather signature, signatures in um, kind of the conventional way. Um, we've actually seen a lot of churches open up their parking lots, and, and even um, the Catholic Church has encouraged their parishes to get more involved in this referendum. So Referendum 90 would move to repeal that bill. Um, you know, I like to say that this position is the insurance policy to that bill. In any event, we're going to want a superintendent in there that listens to parents and teachers. But in the event that the referendum either fails or fails to even make it on the ballot, um, the superintendent is the one that will work with the State Board of Education to develop additional curriculum options so the parents can feel a little bit more comfortable. And I'd, I'd like to include parents and in school districts that had concerns about this um, in the first place. But so to answer your question, Mike, the, the referendum, I believe there was something like uh, 75,000 petitions mailed to 45,000 individuals. Um, 130,000 signatures are needed to be able to get this referendum on the ballot. So doing the math, that's about three signatures per person uh, that requested those petitions. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get there, that people will turn these in. Um, but but the the mark right now shows that we are we're not there yet. So we've definitely got some signatures to gain. Okay, and and Maya, uh, you've made some proposals about how the state can help families teach their children during the stay at home order. Can you tell us about your proposal, or maybe you've got more than one? Yeah, well, one of the first things that I did when I found out schools were canceled was I put together a list of resources, both for parents and teachers, um, to be able to help kids continue learning through this process. Um, you know, it's still the state's paramount duty to educate children. Certainly, there are extenuating circumstances um, during a, an emergency, but uh, kids need to keep learning. This happened just before summer break for a lot of these kids. So they still had a quarter of learning uh, or more. And, you know, we worry as parents and as educators about what's called the summer slide, where, you know, some kids are involved in uh, summer activities or, or, you know, summer learning courses, and other kids um, don't do much structured learning. And when kids come back to school that following year, because we have this model of uh, kids of a certain age following their grade, following their core cohort all the way through, we see kids come, come back to school at completely different levels. So I was very concerned um, that parents, you know, are suddenly left educating their kids um, and teachers were left with, without much direction. Um, we know that Shoreline School District, for example, was ready to go online the next day. They already had a supplemental online um, kind of uh, Google Classroom, I think is what they were using. And they were ready to go online the next day, continue learning. Um, but the superintendent of public instruction, the position I'm running for, he said, no, time to pump the brakes, need you to hold on. Um, it's, it's unfair. Other kids are not going to get that same advantage. So. Um, the first thing that I did was post resources available online. I was happy to see that districts um, and the state were working to provide, um, you know, tablets and other forms of technology, laptops to be able to get kids that didn't have technology access learning again. Um, I know that my kid's school was handing out learning packets once a week, but but really parents and teachers had little direction on 
where are we headed? Where are we supposed to be going? And it's been kind of piecemealed ever since. And so I did write a, a couple of op-eds to that extent as well. One of them was published in the Spokesman Review about how, how embarrassing it is that here in Washington state, you know, tech capital of the country, as I see it, we failed to get our kids online and we failed them from the start to be able to supplement their learning with some kind of online component of the classroom. Um, we know that uh, I think career colleges, for example, all have a digital class component, whether you know professors utilize them to one degree or another varies, but our public education system should have been set up in the first place with this, just like Shoreline was. And so I think our state um, really failed our students in advance and our outcomes show that they're not ready for the real world or college and they're not passing standardized tests either. So we can make all kinds of excuses for, for why we're not measuring up for our kids, but the fact remains we left them high and dry and this crisis has just exposed it. Uh, we got um, a couple of questions from viewers. Um, one is, I'll ask them both and you can answer them. One is, what's the deadline for signature gathering? And related to that is how can our viewers help gather signatures? Can you point them in the right direction? Yeah, there's a couple of um, Facebook groups that regularly post where signature gathering is happening. Um, one of them I think is called Against 5395. Um, the deadline for gathering signatures I'm told is about June 1st. Um, though I think that that may extend a little bit longer. I think they're trying to get all the signatures in by June 1st because of a precedent, and you'll appreciate this, Mike, where um, uh, a petition was gathering enough signatures, was on track, but the deadline was cut sooner, and so they had to go with the number of signatures they had by June 1st. So I think by law, we've got a different, but we've got a precedent that says June 1st. So again, Facebook 5395 is where I've seen regular postings of where you can go to sign a petition. You can also actually download a petition. Um, I think it's parentsforsafeschools.com has information about it. And then there's another site as well where you can actually print a petition. And of course you can mail a petition yourself with a couple of signatures. And one more question uh, for you. Uh, Maya, and then we'll go to the discussion about campaigning during a stay-at-home order and a, and a pandemic. Uh, but Deanna Martinez, who's a nurse that works in Othello and has been on this show a couple of times, uh, she wants to know what you think about Superintendent Reich, Reichdahl's decision not to pay uh, the cost for 700 students um, who enrolled online for lon online education programs when the state or their local districts could not provide them with that option. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting couple of stories that came out both by the Seattle Times and uh, the Washington Policy Center. Um, yeah, it, essentially the story was for, for folks that don't have much of a background on that. Um, the state uh, has approved online schools or certain online schools um, for students and some of the, they get, uh, parents get reimbursed for, for that tuition. And it is a fraction of the actual dollars that the state would otherwise invest for that student if they were in the traditional um, school district. So they're still assigned uh, to a school district as I understand it, but if they opt for this online um, uh, school, then they get reimbursed a certain percentage. Well, the superintendent has since said, no, we're not going to be reimbursing for those online schools now. So now at a time where parents and students need this more than ever and are more incentivized to use it than ever before, um, those options have been taken away. Again, you know, taking advantage of the situation to say, no, we don't need a huge influx of, of students uh, switching to virtual learning. And when I say huge influx, I think that's my inference of why they don't wanna pay for this when they've been paying for it in the past. Uh, but the reality is many students, parents are trying what their local sc school districts are doing. So we don't see every single parent or every single family switching over to online learning uh, or an online school. Um, uh, many of them are just trying to work with what it was. I think the increase they saw was 8%. 
So the state is unwilling to pay an 8% um, increase in that online education that they've already been funding. Um, instead, the response has been, that'll go back to the, the school district that they were assigned to. You already you know, said that you were gonna be doing it. So I think it's really unfortunate because parents don't have much of a choice in public education in this state. Um, that's just the fact of the matter. And, you know, we can argue about, well, you know, the law allows you to transfer and, and school districts, it's a per district policy. The reality is if you're a parent with kids in school and you would like to transfer your kid to another sc school, it, it's impossible. It's, it's very difficult. They make it very challenging. Um, and, and certainly our state has had a history of trying to abolish charter schools, which are a form of public schools in this state another type that receives a fraction of the funding that the traditional schools receive. Um, and of, of course the outcomes are very different and we could talk about that under a different uh, subject, but point is it, the new story is that 780 students or, or families were denied funding so far. And it, you know that should be up to the parents' choice in my estimation. If they wanna go online, we've already said that they'll be reimbursed. Why are we changing the rules in the middle of the game? Well, we continue to get questions for both of you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Maya one last question so we can yeah. move on to right, the last part of our show. <laughs> yeah, well, you look you look really good there in the sun. Um, the, the, we got a question about Seattle schools, Maya, and I don't know how familiar you are, you are with the struggles of Seattle schools um, over the, well, as long as I've been around. Uh, yeah. decades. Um, do you have uh, kind of a quick take on what needs to happen to get Seattle schools up to the next level? Well, Seattle schools are in an interesting boat because one, they're the largest school district in the state. Um, two, they play by their own rules sometimes. And and to answer your, uh, your preface there, I do have some familiarity there. My daughter was actually a kindergartner there in Seattle Public Schools, where she was very much a number instead of a name. Um, and, and another example of where we couldn't transfer to the school of our choice. We were assigned, you know, this school, and it, it was we were completely denied denied appeal uh, for her to transfer to a school that we thought would better meet her needs. Um, so Seattle does their own thing, I think in part because they are one of the largest districts and therefore likely one of the most powerful um, to have influence over this office. Um, they were one of the first that said, yeah, we're not going online and we have no plans to go online uh, during this crisis because we can't ensure equitable access for students. Well, Unequal access has been um, a challenge for public education for a long time. We have mandatory busing that's been uh, involved. We have, you know, breakfast after the bell and all kinds of social programs with relation to schools that we've used to try to rectify those inequities. So the excuse that we're not going online because we can't ensure equal access, I think was exactly that. Just an excuse for why they weren't ready to make this leap and they weren't going to do it. Um, the other thing the Seattle School District has done is uh, removed grades. So you get an A or an incomplete this year. And they said they like this idea so much because it levels the playing field, so to speak, that they think they're going to move to that model going forward. Um, and the superintendent has said, well, that's their prerogative. I don't think it's a good idea for the largest school district to be setting an example like that. Certainly outcomes will show um, but for every student to get an A or an incomplete, I wonder at what point the four-year college system catches up to that, or at what point the students are not achieving to the level that they could because there's no room for, for room or incentive for greater achievement. Um, so Seattle Public Schools is going to be doing their own thing. I think the school, the superintendent um, of public instruction needs to have a stronger um, relationship with the school district. Um, but it, so those are some of the struggles that I've heard and those are my concerns about them. I hope that answers the question about it. It's a great answer. And um, we're, we're getting more questions and I'll just apologize to uh, those of you sending questions in. They're great questions. Thank you for send, sending them in. We're not gonna get to all of them today. 
but we'll have Maya back on another show if she's willing, and we'll talk about uh, in, in even lighting. more depth the, <laughs> these issues. Yeah, better lighting. Let's switch to Hans for a minute, Maya, if you want to work on your yeah, lighting I'm there. Fix um, my lighting well. Yeah, you do that. And um, let's talk about campaigning during a pandemic in the middle of a stay at home order. Hans, you're. Um, I don't know how old you are. You're young, certainly young compared to me, but you're a seasoned campaign veteran uh, because I think you've been elected to office several times. So you've campaigned in normal times and now you're campaigning during a pandemic and stay at home order. Um, just kind of top of mind, how's it, how's it been different uh, for you? And have you seen any sort of pleasant surprises and, and uh, big challenges? Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting because I, I first ran for the state house. Um, I was in my mid twenties uh, at the time. That was ten years ago, um, and that was right off, right after the um, the crash. And we were, you know, uh, in the recession at that time. Uh, you know, cuts to government services, cuts to the state budget, and taxes that had been increased by the Democratic majority were very much uh, front and center. In that first campaign, you had the Tea Party that was uh, still very active in those days, and um, uh, and, and so anyway, interesting bookends to my legislative uh, service, and now starting in local government, where uh, we're going to have some very interesting challenges in county government, uh, and and local governments all across the country are going to have uh, quite a few challenges budgetary, uh, but also saying, okay, as we move into the future, how do we become more resilient and how do we, um, uh, how do we become better prepared for things uh, like this in the future, whether it's a second wave of COVID-19 or some other virus or some other uh, emergency situation. Preparedness is very important and, and very often is uh, under-prioritized in our government planning because we think, well, we need to fund whatever is most immediate. Um, but but then we may regret that later on when something like what we've seen happen does happen and, and certainly we were not prepared for it. In terms of campaign activity, um, I would say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that candidates can connect with voters without doing door-to-door -door activity. One of the things that I have found very effective in all of my campaigns, but I'm doing personally now more than ever is handwriting uh, these postcards to voters and uh, getting those ready to drop in the mail probably a couple of weeks before the primary election. So I've got a growing uh, stack of those sitting in my office and, um, you know, just um, that kind of personal outreach I found to be very effective. People are opening their mail, get a lot of junk mail, but then they see something handwritten and that really stands out. So I've advised a lot of other candidates that that's a, a good thing to do. I know that other candidates, for example, uh, Chris Gildon, who's my state representative, who's running for my Senate seat. He is making a number of phone calls every day to voters and just checking in with folks, seeing how people are doing during this time. And uh, so I think a lot of candidates are doing that as well. And, um, you know, I think we're going to start seeing yard signs pop up around town, just like we always do uh, coming up soon. So there will be certain things that, um, you know, happen in every campaign that will still happen in this campaign cycle. And Maya, how about you? You ran for office once before two years ago, I think, not during a pandemic or a stay at home order. Um, what do you think are the biggest differences between running then and running uh, today? Well, certainly, you know, doorbelling was my game when I, I ran for the state legislature. So can't do any of that right now. I know when we get a knock at the door, it's like we go under lockdown and panic. Who, who's there? You know? <laughs> um, so, so we are making phone calls as well. Um, lots of these Zoom meetings, which have been quite fun. I, I mean, it's nice to, to test out new technology and see people that, you know, have maybe had never used it before using it like pros now. Um, so that has been probably the single biggest difference is not being face to face with people. Certainly, you know, candidates like to show up at events and, and talk with people in large groups. And we don't have the chance to do that right now, which has made it extremely difficult. So these Zoom meetings are, are about as close as we get. Yes, Zoom is our best friend now. I, I have nightmares about Zoom. <laughs> I, I think for me, I ran uh, for attorney general 16 years ago when I was in junior high. Uh, I was very young. No, I'm kidding, of course. Um, and um, for me, what I have noticed is different is the, uh, how generous people are who've never met me. 
Um, this has really surprised me. Um, I've gotten several, many very large donations from people, some of whom said they first saw me on this program, uh, on this Facebook Live event. And uh, what it tells me is that people, um, just regular people, regular voters understand uh, the importance of this election. I have been saying before the pandemic that this year would be one of the most interesting election years ever. That was before the pandemic. Now the pandemic is here. And I think this will be one of the most important elections in our lifetimes because of all of the serious issues that we're grappling with, not only as a state, but as a country. And I think the voters get that. And even though we can't go and meet them in person yet, hopefully soon, um, they really want to be part of this really, really important election season. Um, uh, literally lives and livelihoods are at stake with the decisions that our state leaders and our local leaders are making. Um, so I, I personally am very energized to be part of this election cycle, even though it is frustrating not to be able to go out and meet with voters in person. Um, and I'm so excited that the both of you are running. Hans, I think the state uh, will miss you in the Senate, but I know you're going to do great things for Pierce County and you're going to continue to be active. I know I'm quite confident regionally and on state issues. And Maya, you're going to be a great superintendent of public instruction. Your enthusiasm is infectious, of course. Uh, shameless plug for mainstream Republicans. Uh, both of you have served on the board. Uh, Maya, while I was the chair, and Hans, you were before my time. And um, it's really been great to get to know you uh, in the past and very, very excited to see the arc of your careers. You're both young by my standards and you're uh, current and future leaders of this state. So I'm very, very excited about your campaigns and look forward to helping you in any way that I can. Is there any last word you, uh, either of you wanna offer up before we sign off here? Well, let me just say, um, oh, it's just, we talked about the governor's emergency powers and I think the legislature needs to pass uh, legislation giving the legislature a larger role when it comes to checking uh, the, the governor's exercise of those emergency powers past when, when, when he seeks to extend actions past 30 days. Uh, but, but let me say a couple of other things just briefly that I think the legislature needs to be preparing for um, as we consider our role in all of this. Uh, one is we need to be getting ready for the budget impacts. We just got some information about um, uh, the April revenue impacts that the state is going to be uh, bearing and it's, it doesn't look pretty. That That's information that feeds into the uh, revenue forecast that we're going to be getting in June. And I suspect that we're going to need to come in at some point for a special session. I think that's becoming more likely all the time. So we're going to need to be uh, very restrained in how we think about state spending. We're also going to need to allocate additional. On the other hand, we have additional dollars coming in from the feds. And so we're going to need to figure out a way to spend that in a way that's responsible. Uh, but I think we're also going to need to get in the mindset of restraints and, and, and budget cuts in many cases in a, at a time when we've been spending a lot of money in our state budget for, for several years. The, uh, the second thing we have to do is we have to reprioritize at every level of government. Um, and, and that has some short-term implications as well. We need to be prepared uh, for a, a second wave of COVID-19 in a way that we don't have to shut down our entire economy. Uh, certainly we were not prepared for events this go around. Um, but we need to be prepared in such a way that we can do things better than we have been doing them, that we can be adaptable when it comes to education, for instance, that we can, we can figure out a way to, uh, to handle uh, education without having to shut down our schools entirely. I know superintendents across our state are thinking about that right now, how they might do some kind of hybrid of in-person and, um, um, and online learning. And so I think it's, uh, it, it, we, we've got to think outside the box as we get ready for perhaps a second wave. So thanks very much. Okay, and Maya, we'll give you the last word. Well, I get the, the real last word, but right. any other well, thoughts you have? Of course, thank you for having us, Mike. Thank you for hosting this. I think it's a very creative thing you've done here. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to come on the show, so to speak. Um, I know that during this program, we, we talked a lot about the problems in education and, and what I hope to do or how I hope to address those. But I'd like to emphasize the point that um, the platform of my campaign is very much to reimagine education in Washington state. And it's been that way since day one. Um, I was fortunate enough to travel with the German Marshall scholars around the world, uh, looking at education models that are, that are thriving. Um, 
and, and it's what I learned was that a lot of these things or, or elements that were used in other parts of the country are things that came from the United States. Um, you know, a lot of the technological aspects came from right here in Seattle, Washington. Um, so I invite anybody that's interested in supporting a, a change in our public education to join our campaign, to be part of this um, this reinvention of what public education will look like in our state post COVID-19. I think um, this is a real opportunity right now that we do essentially have a clean slate to work from, um, but I'm passionate ab about the future of education. We need to be educating kids for the future economy, not continuing to work within the confines of this 18th century model. So social distancing is just one of those things that we'll continue to work with if those are the requirements. Certainly, I believe that technology will play an important role in education going forward, but in no way do I think that technology replaces a quality teacher um, face to face with a student. So I think that there, there's a huge wave of people that are interested in um, their child's education where they may not have been uh, feeling very empowered to be involved in this way in the past. So I'm really inviting everybody to help, you know, share your ideas. I've, I've got kind of a vision for how I see things could work, but I want your ideas. I want the best ideas from across the state so that we can reshape this education system to work for parents, teachers, and students in a way that brings success for everyone. And of course, makes the most use of the money that we put in. So um, that's the platform of my campaign, the real premise. Certainly there are a number of things that I think are wrong, um, but I invite you to join me if you'd like to learn more about our campaign. My website is mayaforus.com. Number four or spelled out works fine. Um, my Facebook is at Maya for us, same with uh, Instagram and Twitter. And of course, if you can make any kind of contribution, it helps us to show the number of supporters that we have, um, but it also helps us to reach additional voters um, who may not know about this important race. Finally, referendum 90, we know the deadline is coming up soon. Please, if you'd like to get involved in that, um, find out on the website how you can um, either get a petition and start gathering signatures yourself or show up to one of these signature gathering um, areas. So I really appreciate everyone's help in trying to do that. Please continue to spread the word about this uh, important campaign. It is down ballot and nonpartisan. So the numbers typically show that about a third of the people vote in this election compared to the gubernatorial top of the ticket. So we absolutely need to get the word out. And I'm really fired up that we can do it this year. So thank you for having me, Mike. Well, thank you both for uh, joining me. And um, we had a show a couple of weeks ago with Governor Dan Evans, uh, and we talked about how our state turned the Boeing bust, where unemployment was at depression levels for a short time, um, into a springboard to make our state a better place with um, determined optimism. Uh, and I think you're hearing some of that from uh, both Maya and Hans. Um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. There's going to be a lot of uh, pain, economic and otherwise, in the next uh, several months, if not over the next several years. But we can make our state a better place for ourselves and for our children if we approach this with determined optimism. We've done it before, as we did during the Boeing bust of the late 60s and early 70s. If you want to go check out that show, you can find it on my Facebook page, uh, my Mike Vasca for AG Facebook page. Um, please vi visit my campaign website, MikeVasca.com. Um, I would really love it if you'd make a donation. If you like this kind of programming, you help pay for this. Um, and of course, Maya is a terrific candidate and Hans is a terrific senator and candidate. Uh, and please support them as well. Um, so that's it for day today. We went a little long because we had so many great questions and such great guests. We're going to have to have them both on again because, as you can tell, they're some of the brightest uh, people in politics in our state today. Uh, so I'm going to sign off now. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next Sunday for our Sunday Supper at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live.